Hallelujah. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome, family. Starting with a croaky uh, throat this morning. Hallelujah. Family, welcome to our Sunday morning service, Global Wisdom Center service. Hallelujah. If you're here, send me a comment. I'd love to hear that you are with us this morning, joining in on the service. Martin Jacobs, welcome. Thurlow Dean Johannes. Oh, bless you. So nice to have you at Global Wisdom Center. Angelique, bless you. Sadei. Pastor Darwin Samuels, love you, son. My precious wife. Good morning, good morning. Kim Lowe, good morning. What a joy to have you all this morning. To share from my heart. Hallelujah. Praise God. Mario Martinez, Wendy Lebrand. Wendy, say hello to me there. Philip Roman, Brandon Jafter, Whitney Philander. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for those hearts there. Kim and looks like Martin is the other one doing it. Thank you. Good morning, Elder Philip. That's it, Wendy. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Praise God. Adele Johannes, Josiah, sorry, Josiah, Adele Josiah, good morning. Prophet Xavier, good morning, son. Hilton Isaacs, welcome, everybody. All right, let me start by just opening in a word of prayer and speaking the blessing of God over this hour we will spend together. Father, we thank you this morning for being such a good God. We thank you that amidst our mistakes and our failures, you never give up on us. Your mercies are new this morning for each and every one of us. And for that, we are extremely grateful. We are a thankful people that we serve a merciful God. I pray for everyone that's under the sound of my voice today. I pray, God, that as their faces differ, so do their needs. May the session speak into their life today. Minister to them like only you can, Holy Spirit. You are the master teacher. Nobody teaches like you. And so there are things that I might not even say, but bring it to the hearts of the people what you want them to know. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Glory to God. Vuyo, good day to you, sir. What a joy to have you here. Tazwell van Roy is here and Bronwyn Aranis. I'm going to jump straight in because Tazwell is here. I'm going to jump straight into the birthday celebrations, anniversaries. And I want to wish you and Shani a blessed anniversary. You are one of the greatest men I am privileged to be in association with, to, be a, to have as a friend. Tazwell van Roy is one of those you can take to the battlefield, knowing that he's loyal never stab you in the back if there's anything you don't like you're gonna know that he doesn't like it but he's so dear to my heart he's he's a brother to me and so Taz to you and Shani your precious wife the love the honor the friendship you give me I cannot put enough words to it to thank you and today it's my prayer that God will bless you beyond your wildest dreams I remember us talking many years ago about so many projects we want to do, how we want the Lord to bless us financially and things. And I believe that's still your portion. That is your portion. That God will bless you beyond your wildest dreams with money, finances. Praise the Lord. And then June Range from our GWC branch in Johannesburg had her birthday on Monday. The Lord bless you, June uh, God, increase you, multiply you, cause you to walk in your assignment upon the earth. May the purposes of God be fulfilled through your life. <clears throat> Praise God. Pastor Andre, my son, I see you here. Juleicha, so nice to have all of you here. 
Oh, Sir Andre, I love you. Thank you for being a precious son to me. He is the pastor of our Johannesburg branch. A tremendous, tremendous man of God. If you're in Johannesburg, in the Rudderport area, and you don't have a church, um, I know we can't go to churches now, but Pastor Andre is a man to link with up there. And it was Eliezer's first birthday. Oh, that boy is so precious. I want to just bless his, uh, his parents for bringing in such a wonderful son into the earth. I really believe that these are our children that will walk in uncommon wisdom. They are so privileged to receive it so early. <coughs> Eliezer has amazing grandparents, uh, amazing parents, uncles, aunties, born into an uncommon family of God-believing people, faith people. And you are very privileged when God allows you that. And so the Lord bless him. Oh, and the Lord keep his hand upon that young boy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then also yesterday, we celebrated the homegoing of Uncle Ernie, who is Bonita and uh, Claudine's father. What a great man. What a joy it was for me to preach yesterday at his funeral. I did two funerals this week. The one was easier than the other. Yesterday's one was just, I could just flow because... It was a joy to speak about a man that really loved the Lord and did the work of the Lord. A man that, it, that showed greatness, that lived faithfulness. What an uncommon man. And so Bonita and Claudine and the rest of your family with your children, we gave our condolences to you, but we celebrate the life of a wise man that God gave you as a father. You were privileged. Praise the Lord. Let me just pray over <clears throat> the birthdays and anniversary celebrations. Father, thank you that we as human beings can celebrate birthdays, anniversaries. There are people who speak against these things sometimes, Lord. We know. But we want to celebrate people. We want to love on them. And there are special days that come that remind us of how privileged we are to have these special people in our lives. Today, I pray for Tazwell and Chantal. Thank you, Lord, that you have kept them. Thank you for their union. Thank you for the blessing they are into our lives. Continue to bless them and continue to bless their union in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for Eliezer. His first birthday was this week. Lord, he has a great future ahead of him. I plead the blood of Jesus over his life, the angels of God to surround him all the days of his life, guide him and lead him into the ways of truth, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for Sister June. I pray the blessing of the Lord upon her too and upon her life. Whatever need she may have, Father, would you provide for her in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Family, <clears throat> let me do the offering this morning. I was thinking about the offering and I was thinking of how many people have much to say about the church. But one of the things they complain about the most in the church is offering. Isn't that amazing? People have opinions about a pastor, they have opinions, but they still go to church. But if there's one thing that's debated all the time, it's the offering time. Must we give tithe? Must we give offering? The church is all about money. It's just... And I'm going to deal with some things that people say. I just... I want to help you. And so... That's why I want to deal with certain things. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, Will a man rob God? That's a strong statement. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say... Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. In the beginning of Malachi, the Lord says to the priest in verse 2, 
in chapter 2, sorry, verse 1, he speaks to them, verse 1, 2, and 3, and says, I will put dung on your faces. God says, I will curse your seed, because you as priests bring me offerings that the people give. That is not proper offerings. My friend, a tithe is 10% of your income. If you're giving 5%, don't say that it's the tithe. Say it's an offering. You, or you don't try to rob God. I'm of the opinion a non-tither is a dangerous person. If he can rob God who's watching, what will he do to you that's not watching? I don't want non-tithers on my leadership in the church. If they can rob God who's, not wa who's watching, what will they do to me who's not watching? What things will they say? We need to become tithers. It is biblical. It's what God requires. The offering and the tithe is a biblical thing. We need to recognize the value of it. And I normally speak about the rewards, but I'm going to deal with certain things people say, and I'm just going to help you. Maybe you are one of these people that could possibly be saying some of these things. Let me say that the future of every person and organization is in the tithe and the seed that they sow. It is not in what they receive. The future of Global Wisdom Center is determined by the seeds and the tithe that Global Wisdom Center sows. And upon that sowing, the Lord provides. Its existence is not in just what they're getting from the people and not sowing. In your own life, I can see through this lockdown period, all the people that are tithers in our church are okay. It's the non-tithers that are challenged. And that's okay. Some people are new in our church. Some people are, they haven't been trained and taught. But I can see the cost of that upon their lives. It's biblical. People complain about pastors preaching too long on offering and teaching too long. If any of my church people say that, then I teach for an hour on offering. They know that. They know that because then you are not delivered yet. Then you have not been, then you don't have the revelation of seed sowing yet. As a matter of fact, there's some of my leaders I need to talk to because they only tie the end of the month. And then in this lockdown period, the rest of the week, they don't sow. I know this is a live platform, but this is for Global Wisdom Center's people. That tells me that you don't really believe in the power of seed sowing. To you, it's just an obligation to get it out of the way. But you don't believe you can sow a seed for your future, for what you trust in God for, unless there's nothing you trust in God for. Maybe you just, you're okay and you don't have to trust God for anything. My seeds I sow, I, I put an assignment to it. But most times, I sow to my daddy, Dr. Murdoch, regularly every week. And when I do, I just, I sometimes don't even know what, I just sow because I love him. I believe in it. I believe in his ministry. And I know that God will reward me. Um, but I believe so much in the power of the seed. I can't go a week or a day without sowing because I believe my future is dependent on my seeds. And so when my leaders in the church only sow once a month, after you've been with me so many years and through all my teachings, it tells me you've not received the revelation of the power of the seed. That's for my leaders. Those that are visiting, Sit tight, you must also sow. <coughs> People say words like, when you speak about giving and sowing and blessing and how the Lord blessed you and who you blessed, people say things like, the right hand shouldn't know what the left hand is doing. <coughs> you can take the Bible in any direction you want to go. That's just because 
you know. I understand that. I do. You shouldn't be shouting it from the mountaintops and trying to. But there is a testimony you also give to inspire people. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The left hand, right hand thing is boasting in yourself. The testimony is boasting in God. And you should be boasting in God. Telling how God had provided and how God had blessed you. There's another thing people say. Don't put people under pressure to give. It's only in the church they say that. They don't say it to SARS. Only in church. If that's your philosophy, don't put people under pressure to do things. Then we should get rid of the whole education system. We should take exams out of schools because they're putting pressure on people. I don't believe that the church puts pressure on people to give. And if there is, then you should consider who you under. I don't want to say much about that. Because sometimes it's your own conviction and your, your, your inability to want to give and want to be a blessing. And now you sit there and they preach about giving. Now you say they're putting me under pressure. No, no, no. Your convictions is what's putting you under pressure. That's why we preach salvation. The guy sitting there, we make an altar call because his convictions put him under pressure. But it's only when it gets to the offering that we want to say these kind of things. One pastor said, I don't want, I, I don't take offerings in the church. I just leave a box at the back. And people do these things, but I want to deal with it because there's some mindsets that I'm dealing with. You know, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying it's a mindset of certain people. <coughs> you don't want to talk about money in the church because you don't want people to think it's about money. Is it? Is it about the money? Well, then you shouldn't be teaching. My teaching is to teach people to sow so that God can get money to them. So that God can bless them. I follow the Elijah principle when he spoke to the widow and said, when you sow, God will multiply it for you. I follow the principle of Luke 6.38, give it will be given back unto you. I follow that principle. I follow the principle of Paul in Corinthians when he wrote to them and said, when you're giving, it's for your account. I don't want to tell people to give because I don't want them thinking it's about the money. Well, maybe, maybe it is about the money for you. <laughs> I'm helping people today. Some things are like, yes, pastor. This is comments I hear. Yes, pastor, but people have nothing to give. Who? Who has nothing to give? Whoever tells you they have nothing to give is saying that God has never given them anything. God has never blessed them. God has never helped them. Those are people who say they have nothing to give. They spent it somewhere else and now they have nothing. They had to give, but they, they didn't want to give. Don't tell people when they give that God will give them more. The whole Bible says it. The whole Bible says when you give, it comes back to you. God will give you more. Jesus said, whatever you give up for me, I will give it to you a hundredfold return in this lifetime and persecution because once God starts to bless you people start to persecute you we promise people things all the time but when it gets to the offering we are offended to say when you give God will you know God will reward you God will bless you when we tell people give your life to Jesus there's a mansion in heaven for you you walk on streets of gold. You'll be with the angels of God. We make them many promises from the word of God. But when it gets to the money side, we are so offended. 
Pastor Chris Ross is also watching with us. Love you, love you, love you, Bishop. I'm blessed by your teachings you had on wisdom in the week and also on the anointing, understanding the man of God. I'm touching a little bit on that this morning in my sermon. People say things like, um, the visitors you don't have to give. The people can give. Visitors you don't have to give. Who are you to change God's word on people's, what people must do? Where in the word that it say visitors mustn't give? Because you, you're thinking about giving for the wrong purposes. God wants to bless the visitor too. So they must learn to sow. Ah. And then people pray this prayer. Father, after the offering is taken. Father, bless those who gave and bless those who didn't give. What? What? Bless those who gave and bless those who didn't give? My Lord, that was the reason why I gave, because I wanted to be blessed. But now you're blessing the guy next to me who didn't give. What's the reason for my giving? Pastor, are you saying that when you give to God, it's because you want God to bless you? That's the whole purpose of giving. That's the whole purpose of sowing. Because He promises in His Word all the time that He will bless me. That's why I do it. I gave my life to him for the rewards that he offers me. That's why I did it. Serving Jesus is not always easy. Dying to self, dying to your will is not easy, but I do it for the rewards that he promises me. The Bible says, if you do this, these are the blessings that will come on you. If you don't, these are the curses. That giving is a decision. And so those, I don't pray that prayer. Father, bless those who gave, bless those who didn't give. Father, bless those who gave and help those to get an understanding of sowing who didn't give. That's how I pray. Because I want God to bless you. It's not a game to me. It's not a game. It's not a feel-good thingy. And uh, these are the revelations of my heart. This is what I love. This is what I understand. This is how I've seen God work in my life through the law of the seed. Family, I want to say to you, people will say many things and comment many things. Um, and some of these phrases look so clever and so, uh, so right. But it's all to distract you from your faith and from believing in God. Giving is from God. Giving into the work of the Lord. Supporting the work of the Lord. Is of God. We all have a responsibility towards the kingdom. All of us. If you say you saved and you're part of God's kingdom, you have a responsibility towards the kingdom. Jesus said to his disciples, I send you out two by two. Go preach. Go lay hands on the sick. Go deliver those who have devils. He gave them instructions and then he said, don't take a purse with you. Don't take money with you. Don't take an extra pair of shoes with you. Because those I send you to, the people I send you to, they must receive you. If they don't receive you, if they don't look after you, if they don't take care of you, leave them. Shake the dust off your feet and leave. Don't even leave your peace with them. Because they have a, you have a responsibility as a man of God to go out there, lay hands on the sick, preach, teach. But they also have a responsibility, whoever you are sent to, to look after you. That's what Jesus was saying. Don't take money with you. Don't take a purse. Don't take an extra job. Because the people I send you to, <clears throat> they also have a responsibility in the kingdom. God must help us. Are you fulfilling your responsibility in the kingdom? I pray that you are. I pray that you are.
The biggest givers I know are men of God because they receive the revelation of giving. That's the biggest givers I know. People don't enjoy when I talk like this. People don't like it. But I'm talking to my family this morning. I love you too much to not tell you what's on my heart and my what I believe. And the difference in people is who they've chosen to believe. You don't have to believe a word I'm saying. But the difference in people is who they have chosen to believe. Father, this morning, I pray for your people. I pray that as they sow, that all the negative words they have heard through the years of people and naysayers that's trying to destroy their faith in the area of giving, I come up against that now. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that the spirit of wisdom will destroy that spirit of rebellion, that spirit of ignorance that's holding your people back from walking in the blessing of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to sow this morning into our ministry. Clint Ross Ministries, for those of you that has been sowing, the Lord bless you. Oh, Prophet Xavier will tell you, he, he's probably my top seed sower next to my wife. Keep sowing. Almost every day there's a seed coming through. Doesn't have to be thousands. But I value that, son. Tells me you understand the revelation of this that I'm teaching. If you want to sow into our ministry. And Pastor Xavier has got this phenomenal testimony. He keeps phoning me and telling me, Oh, Dad, I cannot tell you and how the Lord blessed me again. And this week, I won't share all his testimonies with you. But God's just breaking him through. In this time where people are struggling, he's being blessed because he has the revelation of seed sowing. He's a sower. If you're in America... These are my American banking details. You're welcome to sow into our account. The Lord bless you. If you're on PayPal, also international people use PayPal. I use this means to sow into the life of my father, Dr. Murdoch. This is my PayPal account. You're welcome to sow through PayPal. You're watching in Nigeria, in Kenya, different parts of the world and PayPal is easier. You can use this. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Thank you for those that's been sowing 30 rand, 20 rand. It's a blessing to see Carlo and Shade that you have not lost the revelation of the of, of giving. Uh, Bonita, people like that still sowing seeds. Tells me a lot about your understanding of what I've been teaching through the years. The Lord bless you, family. Let me go into the word that I have this morning. My wife wants to show me who's here. Pastor Garth Alban. I love you, son, and your wife. You will always have a special place in my heart. Always. Pastor Johanna Clarson. Thank you. Always a joy um, being in your presence whenever we're together. I have fond memories of many things that we've done together with your husband, Sean. Pastor Sean, Pastor Denwa Olsen, Pastor Clive Bichna, Pastor Denwa Olsen, the Lord bless you. Pastor Anna Sweet and I were talking on the telephone the other day and she mentioned your name to me. Uh, Pastor Clive Bichna. Thank you, sir. I value you. I know I must watch my words when you are here. You were a school teacher. Pastor Hezron Marie, my precious, precious friend. God bless you. Thank you all for being here. Let me get into the word that's on my heart that I want to share with you this morning. This morning, I want to speak to you about understanding who you are assigned to. I speak a lot about the assignment. I want people to understand that. My father has a book, Dr. Mike Murdoch, my daddy. And a lot of what I'm teaching now is what I've learned from him. My father has a book called uh, The Three Most Important Things in Your Life. 
Knowing the Holy Spirit is number one. Understanding your assignment, number two. And understanding the power of seed sowing. That's my father's, uh, he says it's the three most important things in your life you should know. And I agree with him. I believe him. I believe what my daddy says. And uh, <clears throat> there's deeper revelations to honor that I can't always just teach. I teach it to those close to me who sit with me that want to know more. Um, but there's deeper revelations and uh, how to honor a father, how to honor a man of God. The Bible says in Ephesians, you just love the word of God. Kimberly says, I'm the only one she saw kissing the word. Well, Kimberly, I learned that from my daddy, Dr. Murder. He says, you kiss your dog. Why won't you kiss the word of God? Treasure it, love it. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And he gave some apostles the, the verses before that speaks about Jesus. And then it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Talking about the fivefold ministry. For the perfecting of the saints, this is why they were given. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Some people say that when you take the comma away of the saints... It will read like this for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So they teach you the saints how to do the work of the ministry. That is uh, the work of the fivefold ministry. Father, minister to your people today as I speak to them from my heart about a subject that's very dear to me understanding assignments. And understanding who we are assigned to. In Jesus name. Amen and amen. Kimberly Samuels. Pastor Kimberly Samuels made a statement yesterday on a teaching. And it was something like this. That out of all the relationships in your life. Work hard. On knowing your partner in life. Knowing your husband. Knowing your wife. It should be the best relationship or it should be the relationship you're working on the most to have understanding in. You didn't say it in all those words, but that's what I grasped from what she was saying. Very powerful, Kimberly. I believe everything flows from, from your marriage, from your unity, from, from the peace in your heart with those, with those kind of things. If your marriage is rocky, everything else around it starts falling apart. <clears throat> and so that is very powerful but this morning I'm sorry I want to speak to you about your relationship with your man of God we know the assignment I've taught on this that God saw a problem and he needed someone to solve it and that's why he created you <clears throat> God knew he wanted to deliver Israel from Egypt. And so Moses was born. And Moses grew up in the courts of Pharaoh. All part of God's plan, God's design. But he was the deliverer to Israel. When Moses, when God sent him, he said, I can't talk. And God assigned Aaron to Moses. Aaron was not assigned to deliver the people. Moses was. But Aaron was assigned to Moses. When God assigned you, He can assign you to a group of people or He can assign you to an individual. And Kimberly was saying, talking a lot about this yesterday, knowing who you are and knowing who you are not. And in your assignment, it's also important to understand that, that they as pastors in Kennard are called to people there. But they're also under my authority as a man of God. They've submitted themselves to that. And so they're also assigned to me and I am assigned to them. But today I'm going to speak to you about being assigned 
to your man of God, understanding your man of God. I'm going to speak about men of God because they're so misunderstood, but yet there are gifts from God to us. The way you treat a gift sends a message to the giver of the gift. What you think of that gift. If someone gave me these vitamin tablets as a gift and I just threw it one side, I don't send the message to the vitamin tablets. I send the message to the giver of the gift. What I think of that gift, the way you treat your man of God, the way you treat your pastor, sends God a message of the gift that he has given you. I believe that you need to discover your pastor, the man who will take you into the assignment that God has for you, how he will teach you. But let me tell you a few things about men of God. I am privileged to be around many men of God. I believe I'm assigned to men of God. I'm assigned, uh, I bless them financially, but I also am assigned to go teach in their churches to help their congregations understand who they are. Saddens me that a lot of church people can't see the value of their pastor. When God said he wants his wisdom to be portrayed in people, he said, I will do it through pastors. Go read in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. God said, I will give you pastors who will teach you in knowledge and understanding. Pastors are shepherds. Apostles are shepherds. I know they have different functions. Pastor is a sent one. It's, um, the prophets are different. And so the fivefold have so different characters. It's hard for a prophet to be a pastor because of his nature and his character. Prophet wants to say, and, and you have different kinds of prophets too, you know. Um, <clears throat> but some prophets are robust, and some people are offended by that. But that's how God uses them. Understanding who you were assigned to. True men and women of God are different because their assignments are different. And like I'm saying, I'm teaching you from what I've learned from Dr. Murrow. Men of God are different because their assignments are different. They don't all have the same assignment. Billy Graham was a powerful man of God, but he didn't have the same assignment like Jimmy Swaggart. Both evangelists, but different style. Benny Hinn has a different assignment to Dr. Mike Murdoch. One of the things that will put you under a lot of pressure as a man of God is not understanding your assignment because people will tell you you should be doing this you should be doing that you should be feeding the poor you should be on the streets because that's their assignment and their passion and if you don't understand yours they'll make you feel like you are backslidden like you are wrong in what you're doing I heard a pastor in the week say, pastors are sitting in their homes teaching on Facebook Live. They should be out here doing. If I was, if I didn't understand my assignment, I would, I, I would have felt so guilty. Because I send finances to our church people so that they can feed the people. But on the M5, on the way to retreat, there's a roadblock. They want to know where you're going. Well, you know, we need to go to jail for the gospel. That's okay, my brother. I prefer my own bed. You go to jail. I promise you that if the lockdown's done, I'll come and visit you. Men of God have different assignments. Don't let people put pressure on you. Some people, this is what God's saying in this season. That's what he's saying to you. That's maybe not what he's saying to somebody else. Are you upset with your ear for not seeing? Are you upset with your doctor because you won't come mow your lawn? The world understands assignments better than the church. When a, 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 a GP looks at you and says you need 
something to be done when operate, he sends you to a specialist. He doesn't try to do that himself because they understand assignments. Everyone has a different assignment. It's just in the church many times that we don't, we, that's why we're so critical of one another because we don't value and celebrate assignments. And so even the people that's under us are under pressure because they're seeing all these pastors are saying, doing this and doing that. And my pastor hasn't done this. So you don't see the value of your pastor because he's not doing what other pastors are doing, but they're not doing what he's doing. I'm careful what I'm, I, I'm about to say. But men of God are different. Understand that. Now this is what I want to tell you. Understand who you are assigned to. So that you don't put pressure on your pastor. What you think God is saying. He is your pastor. God talks to him. And when God wants to talk to, to you. He talks through your pastor. He talks in other ways. He talks through his word. He talk, But he says I put my words in the mouth. Of a man of God. Know who you are assigned to. Know who God has put you next to. There was a time where Aaron did not agree with Moses on something. He forgot who he was assigned to. Even though Moses was his brother, he forgot that Moses is a man of God. That's why I, I, I count my words when I speak to Pastor Chris. Even though we came from the same womb, I'm conscious that he's a man of God. I'm careful what I tell him, how I speak to him, how I respond to him. When we were kids, I didn't understand this. But now that I understand it, and I know the assignment upon his life, and who he is, let me tell you something. The most important person in your family is the one who has favor with God. Be careful if God has a man of God in your family, how you talk to him, how you address him. When Aaron addressed Moses wrong, God sent leprosy on him. Even though he was assigned to Moses. Know who you are and know who you are not. Know when your pastor is joking with you and smiling and having great fun. He's still your pastor. Some pastors can't get into a social environment with their church people. They can't because the church people's familiarity and they, they can't differentiate that the same man that spoke that anointed message Sunday morning is the same man that's brying with me now on a Saturday just wanting to have some nice fellowship and they lose themselves. And so some pastors never go to functions. Because of the dishonor of people. Rude jokes. Making in front of them. And don't care. Know who you are assigned to. Not all men are the same. Know the value of your pastor. Know what God placed inside of him. What God wants him to bring to you. Let me say to you, you don't have to become everything you admire. There are so many different men I admire. I admire, I admire men of God. No matter what level or platform they are, I admire them because I understand every one of them have gold in them. And so I'm slow to even criticize when I don't understand because I'm always searching for the gold. But I don't have to become Pastor Benny Hinn. <coughs> I admire him. I don't have to become Oral Roberts. I admire him. Now, I'm a lot like Dr. Murdoch because that same DNA and that grace has flown into my life. He's my father. And so there's similarities. But those under my authority, 
those who, who relate to me as sons who have ministries, they don't have to be what I am. They don't have to become what they admire. They can learn from the wisdom. They can learn from our honor teachings, how to respond. But if they are healing evangelists, if they are prophets, they must flow in their authenticity. <clears throat> you don't have to become what you admire. Number two, men of God do not always understand each other. There are differences in understanding because their assignments are different. Do you know that Paul and Peter had a disagreement? There was a misunderstanding between them two. Because the assignments are different. In this lockdown time, there are friends of mine, men of God, who has opinions about a thing and I have a different opinion. We don't always agree. That don't mean that I must shun you out, get rid of you. You're not my friend anymore because you don't agree with me. No, I want to hear your difference because I might be wrong. I want to hear what God's telling you. And the fact that God's telling one man something and another man is doing the opposite don't mean that they're both not hearing from God. Because there are different people God wants to reach who has different minds and different ways of thinking. And so God speaks to men of God differently. But men of God don't always understand each other. And I want you as a church to know that and to understand that. There's differences between men of God. That does not mean that they're not men of God. That does not mean that they don't hear God, that they don't understand God. I always use this example when the Lord spoke to me about um, the tabernacle and respect, honor, and being in covenant with your pastor, when God spoke that to me, he took me to a drawing to understand the tabernacle, to explain that. Because that's how it's easier for me to understand. But when God speaks to someone who's in aviation, he speaks through airplanes and fuel and different ways. He speaks through a baker. He speaks through cake and flour and making. When he speaks to a mother, he speaks through a child and how a child responds. Because God speaks to you in the way that's most comfortable. With men of God the same. And so they don't always understand one another. That don't mean if someone says something that your pastor don't agree with. That that other guy is not a man of God. It's not a time for you to start criticizing men of God. And speaking against them. If God said some people must be out on the street and do some things. Praise God. That's what God told them. But then you must be just as merciful to the man that God said, go on social network and preach there. Because there's more people you're going to reach there. Men of God are different. They're not all the same. Job 32 verse 9 says, Great men are not always wise. Isn't that amazing? Great men are not always wise. We miss it. We get it wrong. We do things wrong sometimes. But that does not mean that that person's not a man of God. I've been privileged to be amongst the best of the best. I tell you of the greatest men upon the, the earth. I thank God that I've been amongst them. What brought me amongst them is my ability to recognize their difference and to celebrate it. If I mention certain names to you, you might be shocked. That I would have, were you with him? But that's not a man of God. That guy's of the devil. That's what you might be thinking. I went there to celebrate the gold, the nuggets they gave me. Things I understand today, they blessed me. I was privileged. You know I'm privileged to be with Dr. Murdoch. I sleep in his house, one of his homes. Not the same house that he sleeps in. Um, depending where he is, he's got different homes. Um... But I sleep in his one home. When he's close to the Wisdom Center, that's the house he sleeps in. And uh, when I go there and my wife is with me, he puts us in that house. But then he's in the other house. That's how privileged I am. Dr. Murdoch opened doors for me to meet great men. 
I met Pastor Benny Hinn. I was privileged to be with him in the office. I met men like Yuba Angel, not through Dr. Murdoch, but I met, those are great men to me. I met Alf Laku. I've had three meetings with Pastor Alf Laku. I've had some great men that I've linked with. Rob Thompson, the man of excellence. I read their books. I sat with their books and read their books other days. And I thought, wow, amazing. God took me there. Got me to meet them. You know, I have Rob Thompson's private personal number. I have Dr. Murdoch's private personal number. These great men of God that I was privileged to meet. Men who wrote songs for Jimmy Swagger them that we sang for years that we were blessed. I was able to meet these people. Do you know why? I could celebrate the difference in men of God. I could celebrate their value. Because not all men are the same. Not every man sees things the same. Do you know who you are assigned to? Do you celebrate your pastor's difference? Or do you want him to be different? Do you want him to be like somebody else? If you want your pastor to be like somebody else, you will never be able to learn from him because he tells me you don't admire him. You can only learn from someone you admire. No wonder you're so critical towards him. Men of God sometimes experience failure. They experience loss. Elijah did. Elijah wanted to commit suicide at one stage. He ran from Jezebel. Men of God experience failures. Things go wrong. They lose a house. They, and then we say, how can this be a man of God? He's supposed to. He speaks about blessing to us, but... God's dealing with his children, with his man of God. There are many people who tell me, but that guy's not a man of God. That guy's not a man of God. I don't want to make that call. Not me. They'll stand before God one day and answer. If they were, if they were not, if they were assigned for something else. One problem I do have with the church is that everyone that gets saved, they want to make them pastors. They all want to make them evangelists. We need, we need people in the work environment to be ministers there. We need people at the workplace. We need kings to be raised up to build uh, uh, financial wealth so that we can do things for the kingdom. Spread the gospel. Not everyone is called to be a pastor. They are gifts given by God to the body. But not everyone... And that's what the church tries to do. They want to make everyone a pastor. Everyone must be a prophet. A guy speaks one prophetic word and he becomes a prophet. And he loses his assignment because he's supposed to be working at the hospital. Where God wants to give him an invention that can make great money to bring it into the kingdom. Now he's struggling. No provision. As a pastor. And I'm not saying when you are struggling as a pastor that you're in the wrong place. But just understand what I'm saying. The kingdom is wide and broad. Not everyone is called to be a preacher and a teacher. But men of God experience failure too. That's a good time to rally around your pastor. That's not a time to leave. Do you know what hurts most? Do you know what hurts most as a pastor? When people leave, the fact that they said, you are my pastor, I will never leave you. The fact that they said, if it wasn't for you, things wouldn't be like this for me. Things would, if it wasn't for you. If you never said those words, it would be easier for me to let you go. But you created so much hope in me. You created so much expectation I invested in you I gave my life to you because that's what you said people who come to me and say pastor I'm here to help you I'm here for a season you don't get the same privileges that others do who has invested their life to be with me and to commit their whole life to everything I'm doing 
knowing they assigned to me. People who come for a season. And I understand you can come and for a season, but I'm not going to give you all the time that I give those who are completely invested into me. That's me. That's how I've had to learn. That's what life had to teach me. Hallelujah. Men of God and women of God sometimes rebel against their assignment. Jonah is not the only one running from what God told him to do. There are men of God who, do you think when God gives you an assignment, it's just easy? Do you think when you're running a business and you're doing well financially and God says, leave it and go preach, it's just easy? Come, I tell you something today. Most people say that pastors go into church, uh, to start a church to make money. Are you serious? Most pastors I know, they were doing well in business. They were managers in their jobs. They were, when the Lord called them to come and start something with a few people. And they did it by faith. One of the hardest things to start is a church. When you're running a business, and I've run, I've ran businesses. When you're running a business, and the people are coming in them to work, not because they love you, not because they believe in you, they want your money. But pastoring people, you have to pastor them, teach them to sow of their money, and still follow your leadership. Pastoring is not easy. And that's why you need to be called of God for it. There are times I wanted to run away from my assignment. There are times I get tired. I'm sitting now with protocols for my ministry because it's getting too much. It's just the access is too easy for people to come and just send me a message. Um, I need this from you. Please pray for me. I, I want this. I want. Uh, will you mentor me? Can you answer me on this? Can you tell me about that? That's besides all the other people who are sowing into me, loving me, people from other nations sending me messages. The access is too easy. And the kind of person that I am, when I don't respond, I feel I've let you down. But I don't know who you are. I don't know where you come from. And you put demands on me. There are differences in people. Not everyone is the same. And so I put a big value on people that sow into my ministry. Oh, pastor, it's about the money. No, that shows me people who believe in me. There's a difference. Pastor, listen to me. There's a difference between people who love you and people who believe in you. Your family loves you. They don't necessarily believe in you. They don't necessarily believe in your message. That's why they won't take a financial seed and sow it into your ministry. There's a difference. And I put value on that difference. Understanding is knowing the difference of value. Difference of value in people. So when your pastor feels sometimes he wants to give up, he's had enough. That doesn't mean he's not a pastor. That doesn't mean God didn't call him. We all get to those moments where we feel we've had enough. You still have to support him and help him. I think next week I'll deal with the individuals and how they respond. Today I'm dealing a lot with who you are assigned to, the, the pastor in ministry. Maybe in the week or next week I need to deal with you, how you respond to them. What's the proof that you are assigned? Men and women of God are the most gentle tools that God will use to deal with his people. Men and women of God are the most gentle tools. Now you might say, because I've been so long around different men of God. I've seen certain men of God and the way they speak to people, um, maybe up country where people are drunk and into wine and stuff. Very rough, very, and then they would say, that's not a man of God. That's the language that people understand. 
and he reaches them. If I had to go with my sweet, gentle Jesus self there and speak like I'm speaking now and speak about honor and the difference of those people would look at me and what's this guy on about? They would never relate to my ministry. But send the guy in there who's rough, who's wild. Send the guy who into, into the gang world to preach on the streets there to the gangsters, wild and rough. And, and they get saved. And you might think he's a rough tool. But he's a gentle tool in the hands of God to reach those people. You have to understand that. How God works. I don't have much time left. I need to finish off. Men and women of God may not be packaged the way you like it or the way you anticipated them. When Jesus came, they thought he will come with majesty and glory. That's why some of the Jews have not accepted him yet because they expected him to come as a king to reign on the earth and to... But he came in normal clothes. What God sends to you might not come packaged the way you anticipated it, the way you thought. And your lack of seeing what God has sent you, the gift God has sent you, will make you lose what God had for you through that individual. That's what this book is all about, the law of recognition. Recognizing what God has placed in your life. Sometimes it's right there. One of my uh, protégés said the other day, where have you been my whole life long? I thought to myself, I've been here for a long time. You just didn't recognize me. You just didn't see me. There's a difference. Men of God might not come the way you think. Men of God do not always have comfortable and enjoyable personalities. Like I said, there are some prophets who's really rough and they speak direct. But that's how God uses them. That doesn't mean that they're not men of God. We all can't have the gentle Jesus love me. Men of God do not always use words of academic excellence and higher education. I fight for simplicity because I want everyone to understand me. But there are men of God who left school standard too. I'm talking in standards you in grades today. But they're doing marvelous work for the Lord. They don't have the highest vocabulary or education or words that they use. But they're doing a great work. There are some men who went to study in theology. But they're not pastoring. The fact that you studied theology doesn't mean you were pastor. Pastor is a calling from God. It's not... A job you choose. I have to get done. I wish I had more time to say things. Men of God do not always recognize when God has spoken to another man of God. Men of God don't always see when God speaks to another man of God. So they disagree and they think it shouldn't be this way. God speaks differently to different men. Ignoring the man of God who fuels your faith can create a lifetime of losses. <clears throat> Ignoring the man of God, that God that you are assigned to, that God has put as an authority over you, ignoring his words, ignoring his advice can cost you a lifetime of losses. Listen to me today. God speaks through his men. You might look at them as ordinary men that, you know, they don't look like a pastor, but the words of God is in their mouth for you. Finally, honor creates access to a man of God. One man that wanted me to speak a lot on his platform. I felt dishonored through something he did and I just, the access is gone. I'm stopping the access. Honor is a powerful thing. Honor creates access. Access to your man of God. Know how to speak to him. Know how to address him. Know how to celebrate him. And the door will always be open. A pastor don't want critics around him. I heard a story of one man. His mother came into the room and said, 
come get done for church. It's church this morning. And he said, I'm not going to church. And he pulled his um, blankets over his head and said, Mommy, I'm not going to church this morning. His mother said, you have to go to church. He said, well, give me three reasons. She said, God can touch you in church. Your faith is built in church. And number three, you the pastor of the church. There are times pastors don't want to go because they have to face these people that can be blatant and rude. And so they want to block the access. I'm working on a gatekeeping system, putting rules in place. Because people think they can just say what they want to say. Do what they want to do and you must be the loving, forgiving one. Because you are the pastor. Family, know who you are assigned to. Know your man of God. Work to bless him. Work to help him. Invest your time, invest your finances to help him build his ministry. Don't be under him thinking, if I was the pastor, well, I will deal with those things. I think I need to do another teaching on this. May the Lord bless you this morning. May God help you. May God give you understanding around these things that we need to celebrate the gifts that God has given us in the body. I don't mean just accepting or tolerating them. I'm saying celebrate them. May God give you that grace. Father, I pray for everyone that's under a pastor who's assigned to a man of God. It's not the easiest thing, Lord. Sometimes it's difficult. Not every leader knows how to display love. Not every leader knows how to have the right words. We are trained in all these things and we have to be trained. But God, that does not disqualify them that you have called them as men of God. Today I pray for your people that they would know and understand who they are assigned to. The gift that you have given them. May they celebrate them, walk with them, help them to accomplish the vision that you have given the church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Apostle Clint Ruet, I had to go off your teaching earlier because I had to start teaching. I love and value you. You encourage me with that testimony. Pastor Edwin George, my precious friend, love you. Pastor Terence Falten, I celebrate you more than I can say. My wife knows she's shaking her head saying yes. Because I celebrate you more than I can say. I love the fact that you're in my life, sir. Pastor Joshua Freeman, bless you, man of God. All the way out there, working amongst uh, our people in Paul area and Marmersbury. Pastor Donovan Goos from Johannesburg. The Lord bless you. Thank you, man of God, for being here. Ellen Range is here. Of our church people are here. I love you. I celebrate you, family. I pray the blessing of the Lord upon you. I pray the grace of God be with you, the mercies of the Lord. Whatever you need in provision, may God show Himself big to you. Not just for you, but for everybody else who's under your influence. In Jesus' name. The Lord bless you, keep you, make His face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. If you want to contact us, these are, I need to make a new board because there's new ways. But this is my, <clears throat> my web page that you can go on. Please be in contact with us. Follow me on Facebook, um, on Twitter. You can follow in on Instagram. You can follow us on Global Wisdom Center. I want to hear from you. Um, not demand on me just want to hear that you were blessed by my message. And there are people who put demands on me and, and that, that affects me not in a good way. Don't, don't put demands on me if I don't even know you. But the Lord bless you, beloved. I love you and celebrate you. Have a blessed day further.